to Investor Insights. I'm Abby Malone. I'm joined today by Kevin Plummer, the head of school for Tampa Preparatory School. Kevin, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you very much. I, I'm so pleased to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Let's begin. After completing an internship at your high school, you were inspired to follow the steps of your parents and become an educator. Today, as schools in the region struggle to be fully staffed, there are a variety of mentorship programs that aim to inspire new generations to become educators. From your experience, what are some creative ways in which recent college graduates can be persuaded and guided to find their vocation in education? I think one of the things for the future that's gonna be critical is that mentorship is present. Um, Education has gotten kind of a rough rap, uh, particularly these last couple of years. And so I think that young folks um, need to have mentors that are present, people that will encourage and explain and even take the role of invite uh, along the way. Um, I think our field has some work to do on helping present the financial security uh, that is available as well. Uh, it's a competitive set of opportunities out there and so young people are definitely thinking about their financial futures uh, and we're going to have to do we're going to have to do better than we currently are. I think that we're going to need uh, a cultural shift also in terms of respect for the profession. Uh, right now, you know, there are a legion of jokes around uh, becoming an educator and becoming a teacher. And uh, I think. I would hope and I pray that we move away from that and so that the profession garners the respect that it rightfully should have and that will draw uh, folks for certain. Uh, but again, I think at the most bedrock level, we're going to have to have mentors and people that are uh, encouraging and supportive of young people going into the profession of teaching. I've been interviewing a variety of different businesses and across the board, one of the main problems at current moment is labor shortage. What are educational institutions doing to make packages and compensation more attractive for employees? I, I don't think enough. Um, if you're in the, the public sector, um, your budget is tied to uh, a revenue source that's tied to taxes and taxes are something that most people don't like and uh, don't want to hear about. And if you're in the independent school sector, you really are looking at the market forces that are out there having a quality program that people are willing to make the financial sacrifice uh, to provide this opportunity for their kids. Um, those models are traditional and they've worked for a very, very long time. Uh, but they're models that need to be re-examined. I mean, at the end of the day, um, to get the best and the brightest, to get those that are going to be the most engaged and, and excited about working with young people so that they can explore the opportunities for their futures, um, we're going to have to come up with financial models that actually compensate people and reward people in a way that it makes their commitment worthwhile and it helps them meet the obligations that they have in their lives. You know, you, you, you hate to get to a point in time in your life if you have a couple of kids and you're looking them in the eyes and because you've chosen education, you can't provide them an education. That seems really, really bizarre. I think there's a lot of ways to skin that cat. I think that there can be some greater partnerships uh, for people that are in education with higher education, everything from discounted to free tuitions and things like that, if you chose to go in the field, right? Like if you've made the sacrifice to help other people reach their dreams, that the reward on the other end could be greater assurances that your kids are going to be able to reach theirs. Traditional approaches to education are changing with the new introduction of new methodologies and technologies. How do you envision future of secondary education and what emerging innovations are you keeping an eye on? I'm keeping an eye on the appropriate use of technology in a big way. Uh, technology is an absolute fabulous tool for all of us, uh, but technology also comes with its challenging edge. And so when you introduce uh, devices into the classroom sphere, you're pulling along all of the things that are on the internet that are challenging for students and families, challenging for their attention, including entertainment, social media. And so the appropriate use of technology to me becomes 
uh, the real challenge uh, that's out there in the future and, and how to help young people be incredibly responsible digital citizens uh, uh, with those tools would be absolutely key and critical uh, for the future. Um, I also think that we, we continue to struggle uh, with communication in a very big way. And so uh, right now, sadly, what's being modeled in terms of communication is incitement, uh, provocative, uh, provocative words, provocative word choice. Um, those are the things that get clicks and get attention. And we're at a place in which we have to refocus on the quality of communication between human beings and um, that words matter and words can help and words can hurt. And I think that that's one of the big focuses for education in the future as well. During the most critical parts of the pandemic, leading pediatric groups in the United States declared a national emergency in children's mental health. As we are progressively coming back to normalcy, what are some creative ways in which schools can be more active in the provision of mental health services and contribute to the overall well-being of minors? I think we're going to have to go through a real strategic examination about the role of community and how we define community. Um, the pandemic left people feeling isolated in lots and lots of ways. Um, and we missed an opportunity to help reconfigure a definition of community. Digital communities do exist. We missed an opportunity to elevate the role of family. Uh, in a big, big way. Family is such an important piece of community. And I, I think that our busy, hectic lives have put um, a set of stressors in there for parents uh, and for kids um, that has truncated to a degree the, def the definition and uh, the latitude that is family. Uh, and there was a missed opportunity to, to grow that uh, during the, the pandemic. And I wish we had a seized it. But as we go forward, I think that in terms of mental health, we have to help people gain a couple of critical skills. One, I believe comfort and being alone. Uh, there is something that can be immensely satisfying with having the time of quiet and reflection and introspection. It's something that many people try through yoga and they try to train themselves to do it. Um, and so we can enhance um, an understanding that there is a high quality of life uh, that can be attained through solitude. And once you're there as well, uh, understanding that the definitions of quality of people that you invite and keep into your life becomes really, really critical. I hate to pick on them, but like the Kardashians should not be a role model for us. <laughs> they just shouldn't. Um, when you're looking at definitions of friendship, uh, I tell the kids all the time, friendships to me, a friend is someone that will perhaps to great inconvenience to themselves, go out of their way to provide support for you. And there aren't a lot of people that are willing to do that just in all of our lives. There's a lot of people we know that we have acquaintances with, but the true definition of friendship, people that um, will extend in times that it is not to their own betterment to ex extend, um, that's what we should be looking for. We should be looking for one, two, three, maybe four super quality friends that we have in our lives and people that we know that are concentric circles of support become very tighter. Family, again, becomes very tight, uh, particularly your extended family, siblings, grandparents, great sources of personal support for people that aren't fully explored because our popular culture definition is how many likes, clicks, thumbs up do I get? And, and that just, I'm not exactly sure it's authentic. And I think people are really craving authentic relationships for their own mental health. I couldn't agree with you more. And I might date myself a little bit with this comment, but one of my favorite TV shows growing up was Saved by the Bell. And I'm sure that, you know, watching it in retrospect, there's probably some aspects of the show that don't really translate uh, to today's world. But uh, they had a small group of friends. They did anything for each other. Uh, there was respect. There was uh, kindness. 
Um, and I, I miss that message as nerdy as it sounds. <laughs> I, I will tell you, I, I'm a little, I'm actually much older than you are. Um, Saved by the Bell, amazing. I mean, there, there, there were bits in terms of the media where I think they tried to model for us healthy relationships and healthy time together. And right. um, my child is, she's an eighth grader and there's nothing more head scratching for me than to see her with her group of friends here in Tampa and Hyde Park and they're, they're walking around, but they all have their phones out and it's literally like they're together, but someplace else at the exactly. exact same time or seeking to be someplace else. And I'm old enough that, you know, my friendships growing up, it was genuine time together because there was nothing else to do so um you played games together whether that be cards or jacks or hide and seek you, you did it together you camped together there was really no access to any other place so exactly. the time and the people that you were with mattered the most and i think it made friendships deeper really deep Round out our discussion on creativity today. What are some unique ways that you're fostering creative thinking across Tampa Preparatory School moving forward? I think for us, it's a, just a huge theme of who we are. It's part of our DNA as a school to be innovative and creative. We want to, at every turn, encourage kids to express themselves, um, to think boldly and to think courageously to use our public square, our classrooms, our assemblies, uh, to really try and explore who they can be, who they are right now, who they hope to become. Um, in terms of the hard academics, uh, we like our students to think that there's no math problem too hard, there's no paper too big, there's, there's no musical too grand, there's no bit of art that is too much. There's no robot that's too difficult. You know, it really is um, creating an environment and a community, a culture that says part of what we're supposed to always be doing is growing and trying and becoming. And so creativity is just a big piece of that. And innovation is a big piece of that. And so that's what we try to do every day is, is to encourage young people to um think in ways that, that we're confident will enrich themselves as, as people and to not be satisfied uh, with just checking a box, just checking a box. Can't be satisfied there. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, this was a real pleasure today. That was Kevin Plummer, the head of school for Tampa Preparatory School. If you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel to hear more CEOs and thought leaders share their opinions and advice on the current business climate. Until next time, my name is Abby Maloney, and this has been Invest Insights. Thank you for tuning in.